there's this guy that was making some something on the internet and he talked about the four addictions uh, when in, when you start using language like addiction the minute you set up a frame addiction you are creating certain trances that's why you have to be very careful with what's called loaded language what's up with loaded language loaded language is language that has trance induction power to it by using a certain word like addiction you immediately conjure a certain kind of trance state and it may be a trance state about yourself or it may be a trance state as a filter which causes you to see your subject in a particular light so this person speaks about the four addictions I don't know who the original author source of that idea of the four addictions but okay they're framed as addictions is that a useful frame I'm not so sure the addiction to the opinions of other people the addiction to drama the addiction to the past and the addiction to worry are those real phenomena are, 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 or are those figments of his mind that he's found these containers for if you went to the container store you can buy all these different shapes and sizes of fascinating plastic containers and tubs and you put things in them and once they're in there you can put your label on it and all the stuff you call opinions of other people you can put in one container and all those things that you call drama whatever that might mean you can put that in another container and all that stuff you call the past you can put that in yet another polyethylene snap top container and worry can go into another one okay NL people NL peeps clearly nominalizations clearly big time super fat nominalizations the opinions of other people drama worry the past denominalize melt those nominalizations a little bit soften them you know you don't have to go all the way into verb land and you don't have to go all the way into noun land because even catch this good students of NLP nominalizing is a nominalization okay when we're talking about oh you nominalize you nominalize you're doing nominalizing okay that in a sense is also a nominalization because it suggests a very black white either or either it's in its action form or it's in its substantive form it's either a substance this is what's being suggested this is the loaded language of using the word nominalization very loaded term that and what it's saying is philosophically is that you're either dealing in the realm of substances or you're dealing in the realm of essences does this remind anyone of um a certain French philosopher René Descartes yes we've heard about that race extensa race cogitans the race extensa the world of substance race cogitans the world of essences nominalizing is there anything in between did anyone stop in any of this entire NLP um, basically um, contest to compare penis size and while we're busy worrying about who's got the biggest dick in NLP did anyone say what are we talking about okay is there anything in the middle between substance and essence is there anything between being and becoming where does nominal, nominalization and the nominalizing process fit in there so what's what's in the transitional middle zones between that uh, are there softened somewhat melted uh, partially flexible fluid middle states between substance and essence what are we going to drop in those containers what are those containers going to be made of so the addiction to the opinions of other people the addictions to drama the addictions to history the addictions to worry I don't know um, possibly the addiction to the opinions of other people 
might be what this guy is saying is, is someone simply has a, uh, a very pronounced external frame of reference and does that then posit the ideal state as having a very, very highly developed, exclusively set up internal frame of reference? Because if you take that too far, you've got a sociopath. Someone with only an internal frame of reference, a t complete internal frame of reference, someone who is completely ahistorical, they are very much in the moment ahistorical people, that's how you make a sociopath. So if you want to sort of put a sociopathic personality on a pedestal, following this model of these uh, four addictions could, could help you do that, could help you move in the sociopathic direction. So somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle is, is the healthier place, I think, where you've got a healthy balance between internal and external frame of reference, where uh, you can definitely check in with the external frame, but definitely have the security and the consistency of the internal frame. How you relate to history, you know, addicted to history, well, what does that mean? I, I know people who are very, very stuck in the past, though, if, if you want to put it in that sense. They're, they're, it's like their timeline, the further back you go in the timeline, the bigger and brighter and more perfectly IMAX and giant the screen gets. It's kind of like instead of the screen getting bigger and clearer and sharper as you get near the present, it's like the, the past is more and more. It's kind of like some reverse perspective that Picasso or Brock came up with like in 1905, looking at everything sort of through this reverse lens that makes the further away it is, the bigger it gets. Yeah, there are people that do that. There are people that have this way of like totally inflating the past, especially about some of the most trivial crap you ever heard of. And are run, I mean just totally run by just the most unbelievably petty shit. You know, and you hear it or they, they start telling you about the thing that is the reason for all this stuff and you're thinking, there's no way. There, there's no way that something that dweeby and, you know, talk about little tiny dicks, man. You're talking about, you know, this little tiny peanut of a penis that's trying to make itself out to be like a porn star. This ant dick that thinks it's John Holmes or something. The addiction to worry. I, I guess they're just people who are naturally worriers. I think a lot of that is, is neurochemical. You know, it's anxiety. People have anxiety. Various anxiety syndromes may have something to do with serotonin. So if someone's like worries a lot and you start labeling them an addict, a worry addict, that's kind of fucked up. You know, it's, it's kind of fucked up and it's lazy and it's evasive and it's not taking into account that we might be actually in the terrain of brain chemistry here. Maybe this person has some kind of anxiety disorder because they've got some kind of chemical imbalance and they need to be taking medicines and they need to be seeing a psychiatrist. So I'd be very, very careful about, uh, dubious about someone that's, oh, you're just addicted to worry. Now you may find all kinds of wonderful, marvelous technique for, for lessening anxiety and lessening worry and lessening the degree to which certain things loom in their minds as these huge, overwhelming issues that sort of take over everything. Yeah, we, we can pare that down and we can bring that into a more reasonable reasonable relationship with the other aspects of that person's life and their internal life, their, their personal race cogitans. Um, but they may need medicine or they may need other forms of counseling. They may have some kind of trauma that um, uh, has produced a genuine post-traumatic stress disorder. I think that's a, that's a real phenomenon. And I think there are a number of other subtler phenomena that are like those types of stress disorder that involve a recurrent thoughts and um, uh, hyper-adrenal responses to them and lowering the ability to suppress certain activity in the mind. Uh, certainly that's, that's real stuff. So I would never just blow that off as that's an addiction. I, I think that is, uh, th that is just basically the cheapest of cheap shots in many cases. Um, the addiction to drama, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of people out there that are drama queens um, and drama kings and drama princes and whatever. Um, do they have histrionic personality disorder? Do they have borderline personality disorder? There are people that, in this world that have, I think, what corresponds fairly, fairly closely to the DSM-4 categorizations and the DSM-3 categorizations. Personality disorders, a, a, stable, a stable condition that makes it difficult to interact in a normal, consistent, healthy, meaningful 